Hello, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Wheeler Centre VCE Text in the City um, programme. Looks like lots of you are studying VCE right, <laughs> right now. Doesn't seem we have too many students in the audience, um, but welcome to you all. Um, my name is Jenny Niven, I'm the programme manager at the Melbourne Writers Festival and with me today is Peter Muse, um, who is the owner of the Brunswick Street um, Bookstore and also a novelist. And today we are going to be discussing Life of Pi. Can I just check who, how many people in the audience have already read Life of Pi? Almost everybody, okay. We'll have a few spoilers, unfortunately, um, for those who haven't read uh, the book already, but I think it'll make for a more interesting discussion. Okay, so Peter, to start, do you want to give us a bit of um, an introduction just to your relationship to Life of Pi? Perhaps tell us when you first read it and what were your um, impressions? Well, it, it, the book came out in 2001 to reasonably good reviews and um, I sold it in the bookstore and it, it ticked over. It, it was an okay seller and I didn't really take any notice of it until it won the Booker Prize, which must have been the year following. And then it took off and it became a huge seller and I thought that I should read it. So I did. Um, and I, I've read it again just last week, and I can't remember my first reading of it. I think I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't read it as thoroughly as I read it last week. I really enjoyed it when I read it again for a second time. But it's one of those books that, uh, from a bookselling point of view, is fantastic because it's a, it's a good piece of literature, and it sells like a mass market title, and it, it sold hundreds and hundreds of copies for us, which we love. Yeah. How unusual is that for literary fiction? It's not as unusual. There's always a few every year. Um, at the moment, there's um, been a lot of coverage and a lot of sales of The Slap, you know, mm. which I think is literary fiction, and that's been a, a record breaker in terms of Australian sales. And um, similarly, last year there was Breath by Tim Winton, huge seller. Um, and Jonathan Franz and just released a new novel, was it late last year? Yeah. And uh, a massive seller. And these are high quality works of literature. So people are buying good books. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so Life of Pi, um, the novel is um, set to, there's basically three sections to the novel. The lead character is a boy named Piscine, or Pi, but we'll talk about the um, significance of that in a second. Um, he grows up in Pondicherry in India, um, and the first sort of third of the book um, is his experiences there um, and some of the influences on his early childhood. The second section of the novel is him um, shipwrecked and the very strange um, circumstances that he finds himself in there. And then finally, um, there's the conclusion of the novel is what happens post shipwreck. Um, but it's got a very sophisticated structure. There's lots of layers. Um, um, and lots of framing devices in the narrative, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, but perhaps we can just elaborate a little bit on Pi's early life and what, what you think the major influences on, on him were when he was little. Well, he elaborates for himself that, that his key concerns as a child uh, growing up in a zoo in Pondicherry were animals and religion. Uh, religion a little bit later on. I guess he was he was a teenager by the time he he was exploring religion. But animals were everything to him. But it was complicated by his name. Yeah. Should we talk about that for a moment? Because his name Piscine, which is French swimming pool. But at school everyone called him Pissing, which uh, he really <laughs> didn't like. So he had to um, manufacture a way as a boy of changing his name to an acceptable name, which was Pi. Um, and he did that in a very um, strategic and um, reasoned way um, when the opportunity arose by changing schools. And it bears some similarity to the way he, later on in the book, was able to tame the tiger in the lifeboat. I think. Okay. I think there's a similarity there, because he was able to master his domain. Mm -hmm. Why, though, was Pi an acceptable 
alternative because in a way a kind of mathematical equation for a 12 year old should be as inaccessible for children as PC in a French swimming pool is but but that's not what happens what happens is that the other kids in his class all want to change their names to Omega and Alpha that's right. <laughs> and all these other things so. yeah that's right um, that may be the author at work yeah I think um, but it does it does have a, um, a, a logical sense in that his name's begins with PI, so he shortens it to that. But Pi has a, has a lot of connotations from an authorial point of view to, um, uh, to give the reader all these connotations like uh, a mathematical limitless, uh, who, the number is, is, is infinite, is it not? I, I think it is infinite. And it's the diameter of a circle, all these things that you think, for a long, before I read The Life of Pi, I, I was, put off by that because I thought it was a book about maths. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a trick of the author. Yeah. So how do you think his mastery of his name and therefore the situation relates to him a little bit later on and his qualities? Well, I think it gave him an experience of how he was able to um, change his circumstances to, to survive and it was a matter of survival. Uh, as a child in a school being called pissing was just untenable and being on a lifeboat with a tiger is untenable. Yeah. So he was able to um, manipulate both situations to survive. Mm. What was unusual about Pondicherry and about the way he grew up there um, in his early life and, and most closely I suppose that question is related to religion. To religion? Yeah, and his exposure to all these different well, Fairship. yeah. Um, well, he grew up, Pondicherry. I, it was a small town, a small province with French influence, and he he grew up living in the zoo. Uh, so his primary influences are walking to school through the zoo and greeting the animals along the way. And uh, it's a very unusual childhood. Uh, but he also grew up a Hindu, and uh, which is. Um, a religion that is full of stories and um, it relates to animals as well in that many of the gods have animal characteristics or are represented as animals. And um, he, he embraced that as a matter of course. That was his, his born religion. But whenever he was confronted, it seems, with another religion, Christianity or with uh, Islam, he embraced that as well. He was, he was uh, polyreligious. And there's a very uh, interesting scene early on when the three religious leaders from each of those churches, a Hindu, a um, Muslim and a um, Catholic, f um, confront his parents saying, you must get your son to choose one religion. He can't be all three. This is, this is not right. And Pi was able to say uh, he just wanted to embrace love. And they had no answer for that. I thought that was interesting. I love that scene. It's lovely. They're on the boardwalk. They're sort of by the sea. The family are eating ice cream. And then Pi sees these three, the imam and the Catholic priest and the Hindu. Um, holy man, they're all converging on his family at the one time. And then there's this lovely kind of sly, mocking humour about the conversation and the way yes. that Jan Martel writes it, because he sort of says, at the, at the one time he's presenting it as, as an impossible choice. He needs to choose one of the three religions. But at the same time, he's highlighting the real similarities between the three leaders and the, how upset they get when they accidentally end up on the same side and yes, how right. shirty they all are. Yeah, yeah. It's really, I, I think that's a tone that carries throughout life. Yes. Pie, there's this humour underneath everything that's really, yeah, it it's lovely it's a nice space to be in I think mm, yes it is um, so religion is, is a very key part of his childhood uh, along, along with growing up in the zoo and his family of course um, and uh, I think that the childhood that he experiences at the zoo in Pondicherry uh, is full of lessons that he is able to use later in his in his ordeal, which is a very long um, castaway story. Is it a year? Not quite a year, but a very long time. So he needs to draw on all of those experiences that he learns. So um, the education that he gets. Uh, as a child is largely in religion and in reason, zoology, and 
in, in um, well, in, in, in animal welfare from his father, animal animal management rather. And observing the behaviour of the animals yes. as well. We talked a little bit about some of the traits of the animals, the zoomorphism and things. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, he's, he's warned by his father. He's given a rather graphic lesson by his father uh, about the danger of animals. Um, prior to this, the, the, his, his father is always saying that man is the most dangerous animal in the zoo. But uh, he, he, his father wants to reinforce to him how dangerous it is to anthropomorphise the animals in the zoo to embody them with human characteristics, which is a natural, it seems natural, tendency of humans to, to want to think bears are cuddly and tigers are cute, or maybe not tigers are cute, but... Um, <laughs> and and he, his father takes him to the tiger enclosure and, and he, he and his brother to watch uh, exactly what goes on. And he, the, his father releases a goat into the tiger's enclosure and there's a brutal killing of that goat. And I think that's a key lesson in... in, in uh, the, uh, his father is able to impart to him. And I think that that's an example of a number of lessons that are given throughout that section of the novel, which are later used to his survival, right. for his survival. Yeah. It's a, it's a very brutal scene, isn't it? And it has echoes later on in the novel when we're given the alternative reading of his time yeah. as a, a castaway as yeah. well. And it's quite a different sort of tone to that much lighter humour. And the, it's, it spans a lot of... There's a huge range in the novel. Yeah, yeah. Regard. Yeah, there's a lot of violence and terrible... <laughs> terrible acts going on. Which sits like at, at such a kind of cross-section with the fables and the lovely tiger story and yeah, you know, yeah, it's a yeah. lot of contrast. Yeah, yeah, and the, the ties in with the religious stories that um, that he grows up with as well from, from the Hindu religion largely which are full of lovely animal stories and right. um, the animals are embodied with characteristics of humans. Mm. Which um, he he also uh, he populates the lifeboat that that he ends up in for the majority of the story. He's in a lifeboat with with animals and. Um, so just to, for people who haven't yeah. read the novel, there's a section, him and uh, the family leave Pondicherry and the idea is that they'll sell most of the zoo animals um, to zoos around the world and they will go off to live in Canada. So the next section when he's, um, he embarks on this long boat journey, there's quite a few animals on board um, and then this all goes horribly wrong and the boat sinks. So the next sort of third of the novel, or maybe even longer actually, oh, yeah, the, yes. yeah, um, significant section um, of the middle part of the book um, is what happens to Pi after the boat is sunk. Um, so flash forward to him being in the boat, there's a tarpaulin, there's a Bengali tiger underneath it, there's a hyena and there's a zebra with a broken leg. There's a zebra. Yeah. Interesting bedfellows. <laughs> and there's an orangutan. An orangutan, of course, yeah. And there's a rat. And there's some flies and some cockroaches. The, that's the extent of the, the zoo that he has, his personal zoo in the lifeboat. But um, having railed against anthropomorphism earlier in the book, it's hard not to see the characteristics of the animals with anthropomorphic eyes. So that the hyena who is causing havoc in the, in the first stages of the lifeboat section is the cowardly, horrible, disgusting creature the, the zebra is a kind of exotic, uh, beautiful creature, and the orangutan is a mother figure, maternal, trying to protect. And and um, all of and, and then there's the tiger who who is the the man eater, um, and and he the author. Um, does seem to, or even Patel, who is narrating, Pai Patel, who is narrating, does seem to inescapably embody these animals with human characteristics, despite protest, protestations that he, he wouldn't have, would never do that. 
and that's again jumping forward to to the very end. Can I jump forward to the end? The when he's telling his story to the Japanese interrogators at the very end, which is a very comic scene, but a very important to the novel. Um, and he's asked, they don't believe his story, and he's asked to tell a different version, or he, he offers a different version in which he populates the lifeboat with a cook instead of a hyena, a sailor instead of a zebra, his mother instead of the orangutan, and, and himself, there is no tiger. And the human characters in that version of the story all contain those, those anthropomorphic elements. Once again, there's the, the mother, who's the mother, and the cook, who is the evil hyena. Yeah. And the poor Chinese sailor with the broken leg is the exotic... Beautiful zebra. Zebra, beautiful zebra, yeah. And that's another example of just terrible violence in... In the story, in the it's novel. really shocking that final section, is it? So we're at the end of the novel. Um, Pai is in a hospital in Mexico where he's washed up eventually, um, and he recounts the story of being in the boat with the tiger and all the animals and what happened to two Japanese um, representatives from the shipping company of the boat which was sunk. So he offers them this story, and we realise that that's the story we've been being told over the last sort of. A couple of hundred pages, um, but they're totally dissatisfied. This is nonsense. This couldn't have happened. This isn't a story that they can accept. Um, so he offers this other um, story, where, as you say, all of these different characters are represented by people rather than animals. Can you just describe the contrast between those two stories? Because it's really they're, they're day and night in a lot of ways. Between the two versions that he gives. Yeah. Well, um, it goes to the key, uh, the heart of the novel, really, because he's offering up the story of with the, with the animals on board the lifeboat is is kind of a wonderful story. It's fantastical, it's allegorical, and very engaging, and um, the reader is taken along on on a huge journey with with the narrator. In the second story involving humans on the on the lifeboat. It's a brutal and unpleasant and um, unlikable version of the same events. And he asks, well, which version would you like? The lovely, expansive, still with a bit of violence, but largely enjoyable story, or the horrible one? That's what he offers the Japanese interrogators. And... Um, so the question is, which is the better story? Which is a concept that is at the heart of the novel because storytelling is what it's about. And he's asking, um, in terms of religious beliefs as well as um, narrative forms, why not choose the better story? Yeah. Hmm. And that really is the crux, isn't it? Yeah, if you're going yes. to put your faith somewhere, where are you going to put it? And as yeah. we mentioned earlier, there, there's some flags that that's where we're heading earlier in the story, aren't there? Um, yes. Um, there's, there's a key moment. Uh, can I talk about the... You can talk about Chapter 21, like. <laughs> chapter 22. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's a good way. Is it... Key moment in this telling of the story, and it's chapter 22, which I'll read to you in its entirety. I can well imagine an atheist's last words White, white, love, my God, and the deathbed leap of faith. Whereas the agnostic, if he stays true to his reasonable self, if he stays beholden to dry, useless factuality, might try to explain the warm light bathing him by saying, possibly a failing oxygenation of the, the brain, and to the very end, lack imagination, and miss the better story. And the two concepts there are the well, the t two key phrases are the dry, yeastless, yeastless factuality and the better story. And so the dry, yeastless factuality, which is, he equates with agnosticism, is like a dry, flat, uninteresting bread. 
and the better story is the one with the yeast and the risen, beautiful, warm loaf. Which do you prefer? That's that's at the crux of what he's saying, and that we need stories like we need sustenance, uh, as in we need food. And the better stories are the are like better food. They have spices and um, exotic tastes and relishes and the 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 stories that uh, engage us and fill us, fulfil us are those, and the, uh, the alternative is very dry and boring, and why would you take any notice? That's, yeah. that's really... And that's really interesting, too, because it relates the idea of sustenance, because it relates to the fact that for most of the book, he's both starving and, um, and, <laughs> and thirsty. He's starving and thirsty, and, and hunger is the, the key to it. I think it, he begins the novel, does he not? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. The the very opening, he says. The very opening line is, this book was born as I was hungry. And and obviously, so it's it's working on a metaphorical and a literal level. We're hungry for stories to sustain us spiritually, and we're hungry for food to sustain us physically. And it's a story of both his physical maintenance of his body and his spiritual maintenance of his soul. Mm. And there's these lovely passages when he is starving and beginning to get a bit delirious and he lists all the foods that he wants to eat and when he's in conversation with Richard Parker when they're both delirious and Richard Parker's the tiger. um, And they're listing all of these amazing foods that they would have and it reminded me of earlier in the novel where he's listing all the animals in the zoo. So you've got these lists and lists of all of these wonders that the natural world or that you can kind of feast on whether that's in fact or in fiction. And there's also the rather strange encounter with the other castaway in the other lifeboat mm. who's also blind. The pie is blind for a brief time during the story and during his blindness another boat comes alongside containing another blind castaway who um, in the latest story, in the version offered to the Japanese interrogators is the French cook from the ship. And he engages, they come close together, ship to ship, or lifeboat to lifeboat, and their conversation is entirely about food. Mm. What would you have? <laughs> what, would you like, what would you like to eat? And, and also um, the, the older... Um, Pie when he's in Canada and is being um, interviewed by the author, the author, uh, he's always providing the author with this spicy, lovely yeah. food that the author can't cope with. He's, he hasn't got the constitution for such spicy food and it makes him sick. But it's also um, what, that, what that's doing is that he's talking about how Pie is able to. Um, make his food enticing and interesting and different rich and exotic and yeah. rich and so much so that you don't actually know what the meal is you just know you're having something lovely right. which is uh, not dissimilar to the novel in that you don't know what the story is really you don't know the truth but yeah. you've been given all these trappings of loveliness to well, there's the other thing about it. It, it. It's obviously a very complex novel in terms of its allegory and symbolism and things, but it also is a very sophisticated structure, which references again that idea of truth and reality and whose truth is it and who is telling the story and yeah. who is the author and who's the narrator and what is the relationship between all these people. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. The when I when I came to read the book for the second time, I started reading at chapter one having noticed that there was an author's note, but normally I kind of ignore the author's note or the introduction. I just go straight into the story. But I noticed also that uh, it was quite a long author's note, and I thought, well, that's odd. So I read the author's note, and immediately I realised, oh, that's where the novel begins. The author's note is written not by the writer of the book, although of course it is. It's written by a fictional author who's giving us a a mixture of truth and fiction 
um, because he's able to, um, he tells the story of how the, the, the story was told to him. Uh, he was directed by um, Mr. Ad, I can't remember how, he, how to say his I name. I don't either. Adam I don't know. Yeah. Adam Bassami, um, about this tale that would make you believe in God, mm -hmm. which of course is an um, outrageous claim. For a, for a story, and um, it details the circumstances of the of the author and the the way he's uh, able to find out about the story that he's going to produce to be this novel. Uh, and at the end of the author's note, he then does the traditional thing of thanking a few people and the council, Canada Council for the Arts for the funding and the Japanese um, maritime body who send out the interrogators at the end. So he's, those, those authors' thanks are both real, presumably he's thanking the Canada Council for the Arts, and fictitious, he's thanking fictitious characters. And he also thanks, um, in, in the author's note on the last page, he says, um, as for the spark of life, I owe it to Mr. Moesa Sklar, who, and that's all he says, just that one name. He doesn't say why, but it turns out that that name is the name of a real author who wrote a book back in the 80s, and that book was about um, a castaway, a Jewish castaway, who was cast away in a lifeboat with a black panther. And that book didn't receive anything like the success of this book, but it was a real book. And um, it wasn't that a strange postscript to that about was, truth and fiction too. Well, I don't, I don't know about that particular book. I well, I read that he, Jan Martel, had never actually read that original book with the panther in the boat. That's what he says. But he'd read a review yes. in the New York Times by yeah. John Updike of this book. But upon consulting the New York Times. Archive and John Updike, neither of them had ever heard That's of right, this book. That. <laughs> That's right. So it's all truth within fiction, within lies. It's it is. It's interesting though because I looked up and there is a book available to buy with that title. You should buy it. I should, I should check <laughs> it out. Stock it at the front. <laughs> <laughs> I should check that out. Uh, anyway, what he's doing in the author's note is setting up a fictitious author to tell you a fictitious story. So we have. Uh, the author as narrator, and he he appears in the italicised sections of the books, uh, in the early section, the childhood section of the book. He appears in, in these italicised sections, which are accounts of his interviews with the adult pie. And uh, you could almost believe that this is the way uh, a real author would present himself. Um, and then he has... Pi narrating in the first person the story of his shipwreck. And uh, so there's, there's a fictitious author narrating a fictitious story about a fictitious character. Uh, and in the final section, uh, which is the interview when he's in hospital with, uh, in Mexico with the Japanese, um, there's a third author mm -hmm. or narrator. So I think there's at least definitely two narrators and possibly three narrators. And above all of that, you've got that person who wrote the book, who's Jan Martel. Yeah, yeah. Right. So there's an elaborate structure, and you never know when you're reading it what is truth and what is fiction. I, my take is that it's all fiction and that there is no truth apart from possibly universal ones. Yeah, lovely. Shall we have some questions from the audience? I've got about 10 minutes left if anybody would like to ask something. Um, I, I read somewhere where there was actually talk of uh, the plagiarism side on the book. And I know you just mentioned the book in the 80s that was written, but there was also, he was sort of facing facts of denial of whether he actually plagiarised the last book. So I'm not sure. Uh, that, that, that was referring to that book, which was called Max and the Cats. He, Unless it is an, all an elaborate fiction, including the allegations of plagiarism, um, he, the author of the book about the panther and the Jewish man in the lifeboat uh, kicked up a stink and said, you've copied my book and 
you've won the Booker Prize and I want some money. And uh, it was resolved by a meeting between Jan Martel and this other Brazilian author. And uh, that's all it said, that the, the two authors met and there was no, nothing further. So there was a conversation of some kind and plagiarism was discussed between them, but not in public. So I think, think it is mysterious, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was fictitious. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you think that guy actually exists? <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. It could be an elaborate hoax. That wouldn't surprise. There's another thing I, I wanted to say about um, the fiction. Um, when, the, when he's growing up in, in the zoo, the zoo itself is uh, a fiction of the natural world. You know, it's a, a con an artificial construction where the animals live as if they're in the real world, but they're not in the real world. And uh, in the same way as a novel is a fiction for us, the zoo is a fiction mm -hmm. of animals. And we didn't talk about um, the what's called zoomorphism, which <laughs> is me. where... Um, Animals uh, believe that other animals or even other human beings are the same beings as them. For instance, lion cubs brought up by a dog will believe that the dog is a lion mm -hmm. uh, or will act as if the dog is a lion or, uh, or um, suspend their disbelief, if you like, so that um, in order to survive in a happy way, as if they have a mother, they'll believe the fiction that this dog is a lion. And in the same way, a troop of lions will submit to a lion tamer, even though they know that it's a flimsy human being, but to make their life tenable, they, they believe that he is the master and he is the head lion. Uh, so they, they engage in fictions themselves. Mm -hmm. How do you think that relates to his perception of religion then? about submitting to something that you perhaps know is not literal truth? or Well, that's interesting. Uh, I don't know. I, I find it... Uh, I, I don't know. You mean, when you say he, do you mean pi? Well, pi or, 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 or Yan or, or whoever, yeah. whoever the I is in yeah. that situation. The, well, pi, pi in the end says that storytelling is the, uh, the thing that gives him spiritual sustenance. So that, that is his religion and the... Um, and there is no absolute truth. There is no right? absolute truth. Oh, apart from pi, 3.1426 is an absolute truth. It's so lovely the way everything sits in relationship to everything yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. Such a clever novel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, could you comment on the um, island when he landed? I found that very confusing. Didn't quite yes. understand that. Yeah, it was very confusing. <laughs> Um, for those who haven't read it, the, uh, uh, towards the end of his time in the lifeboat, um, they are, he, it's just him and the tiger at this point, all the other animals are dead. Uh, they both go blind. Both the tiger and, and Pi are blind for a short period of time. And um, it's through hunger and um, malnourishment and whatever else you might imagine. Or it's a spiritual symptom, either or. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's blind. he could be blind literally or could be blind as in having lost his faith. And at just immediately, um, and at during this time is when the Frenchman in the other lifeboat comes and is eaten by the tiger eventually uh, and um, so immediately after that Frenchman appears and they're both blind uh, they arrive upon an island of algae and it is a carnivorous island populated as in it's, a, it's an island that makes no sense whatsoever it, it's populated by meerkats and during the day it's all light and fine and at night something terrible happens and the island itself will kill you. And I found it very difficult to understand. I thought it was just a delusional um, hallucination or something. But now I think possibly it's more to do with dark and light and faith and not faith. 
<laughs> and that it represents him um, reaffirming his faith somehow. So the, the dark is the night when the, the island is carnivorous and the light is of days when God is um, yeah, that's exerting his influence. Uh, but it was very problematic and I couldn't really say. It's a very puzzling section, isn't it? And it, given that everything else in the novel is so allegorical or symbolic, that there's always a relationship somewhere else, I found the same thing, that I wasn't just really at all sure where to put that right. section. But I hadn't considered it about faith and non-faith or faith and despair. And yeah, well, I, I only think that because of the blindness, because he was blind and then he could see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Nope. Oh, one at the back. Uh, just going to the island, I was equally confused by that as well initially. I thought maybe as the narrative progresses, it's as if Martel's um, challenging the reader to believe these certain things, that that part of the narrative becomes in a sense more extreme and the, the demands on the reader become more extreme as well. And so I suppose the question is, um, do you think at a certain, to a certain degree the, the narrative is as much about the reader as it is about what's going on in the story? Absolutely. So, um, yeah. In the end, the, I suppose the alternate narrative, the, the one that's given to the, China, uh, sorry, the Japanese investigators, is as much a moment of testing what the reader wants. So the story is actually the narrative is about the role of the reader as much as it is as the storyteller. I agree with that. I think that uh, in the final section where, where uh, the Japanese are interrogating him, he, he tells them the story and they say, we just don't believe it. We find that incredible, which is why he says, well, well I'll offer you another story and see if you believe that, um, or which one you would prefer to believe. And that's right. It, it's, it's such an interesting idea that, OK, you've chosen you want fiction, but how much fiction do you really want? Yeah. You know, how far are you willing to yeah. go with this yeah, really I think that, delusional I think that, that that makes a lot of sense, that he's stretching the bounds of credulity of the reader. And uh, by and large, we, we, we go there. We say, oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. Well, I think that's a nice place to leave it. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. It's really interesting. I hope you'll all go off and reread Life of Pi. <laughs> Thank you.